Come on, let's go for it. Dog, gotta, we gotta find some energy. Come on. I
Hey, good to see y'all. I just wanted to let you know that we're doing a few announcements today and one of them is about Timothy team registration. You don't want to miss out on the learning about the Bible. We're doing Genesis this year. So you can register for that online. You can register through Realm, Facebook, or on our website, heritage.church. So be sure you do that. You don't want to miss out. Another event we're having is in August. Um, Matthew 25 event will be August 3rd. We're going to do that at the First Baptist Church parking lot. It's a drive through event from 6 to 8 that evening. We'll be handing out backpacks with supplies in it, and you don't want to miss out on getting supplies for your kiddos. It's for everyone. So please join us at First Baptist Church, August 3rd, 6 to 8. Another event we're having is for the local missions, and it's an event where we're going to be helping the community with their yards. It's for folks maybe that can't get out and mow or clean up or take care of their yard. So that's going to be August 1st and we're just going to be asking men or women to come volunteer and help us clean up yards. So if you have a lawnmower or weed eater or blowers or anything that might help for yard work, we would like for you to contact Jake and um, let him know that you're available to help with that. So we want to get out in the community and show the love to everyone that needs the help. So that's all I have for you today and I hope you have a great week. Well, good morning Heritage. Uh, my name is Brian and just as we enter into our call of worship this morning, before you worship, I just want to remind us of Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18 and 19. It says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen or no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior, the Sovereign Lord is my strength. I just want to remind you, you may feel like one of those areas applies to your life right now, but God is still a God who's moving, He's working, He's alive, He's producing even when we can't see it. So this morning as we worship, let's worship Him for the truth of His Word, who He is. No matter what we see, we know that God is faithful. Nothing but the blood, 
nothing, nothing but, but the blood of Jesus. All things are possible. When we receive Jesus, you keep your promises. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, if you said it, we believe it. if you would join me in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you and we're grateful that we can call you Father, that we are your sons and we are your daughters. And in this time that we can focus our attention to you, 
that we can lift up our praise to you, that we can lift up our request to you, that we can ask for your covering, for your blessing, for your direction. Lord, for your kingdom come, for your will be done. Lord, we can, we can ask for all these things, but yet still claim that it is only by your power. It is, uh, we claim that we only want your kingdom and it is all for your glory. So Lord, right now in this season, we come before you and, and we ask, Lord, that you would, you would hear our cry as your children, Lord, that you would uh, hear the requests of our hearts silently as, as we might vocalize them where we're at right now in our upper room or our place of worship right now. But Lord, that we come before you and we say, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, we desire your heart, your mind, uh, Lord, your ways. And in, in that, that perspective, God, we can bring our requests before you the needs of our family, the needs of our, just ourself, our daily bread, Lord, the needs of loved ones, those who need healing in our congregation, in our neighborhoods, those who need healing in our, in our family, who need physical, who need spiritual, who need emotional, those that have a need for a job, those who have needs in their finances, God, just even for literally daily bread. God, we come before you because as we read in Habakkuk earlier, we're reminded, God, that you are faithful. And so we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. And Lord, we just, uh, we just look to you to be our leader and our guide in our city and in our schools, Lord, in our, our county, in our states, in our country, and in this world. God, you are the king of all kings. You are the one who sits on the throne above all thrones. And so we look to you for your leadership. Lord, guide and direct us, we pray. We thank you that you hear our requests. We thank you that we can come before you, uh, Lord, and confess sin and, and know that you forgive our sin. And, and then we have the, the opportunity and the privilege to offer that to others as well so that we can be right with you, Father, and we can be right with others. Give us a heart, Lord, to love you with all our so heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others as well. And God, give us a heart to be disciples who desire to make disciples. Lord, for this journey in life right now is all about you. It's about making your son known. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you, that we can pray, and that we can also collectively pray the prayer that you taught us in the word by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. If you got your Bibles, open up to Jonah. Uh, thanks to the whale incident, children of all ages are very familiar with this little book, but we often miss its complexity and its message to God's people. Jonah, however, he didn't miss it. He came back from his experience at Nineveh and he told his story and that story was intended to swallow whole Israel's wrong thinking about themselves, about others, and about God. As his chosen people, a prized, treasured possession, Israel's thought was that they had been set apart for him and they thought about themselves that they had kind of become rather, rather a bit special. And while being holy and special does mean being set apart, different from the world, an ironic aspect of holiness is that deep down you're no different from them, from the ones you're set apart from. What Jonah and Israel missed, and I'll tell you straight up from the beginning, was that belonging to a God who's all about crossing the boundary between us and Him means that there's no room for us and them thinking. So you're trying to tell me it's not about a whale? Nope, it's not about a whale. Uh, the whale or fish or the sea monster, whatever it was, was just one of the many outlandish things that happens in this little book. When the original audience heard this told, when Jonah came back to Israel and shared his story, uh, and as we read it today, we're kind of supposed to go over and over, whoa, wow, that's crazy. One of the first things that hits you is that Jonah thinks he can hide from God, which again is crazy. Next crazy thing is pagan idol worshiping sailors who, even though they figure out Jonah's the reason behind the storm that's threatening their life, they try to do the right thing. They care about him and initially resist throwing him overboard. It's kind of crazy. They're like, wait a minute, you're running from the most high God? And you thought that'd go well? Even they say, wow, that's crazy. We'll try our best, and they row, and they row, but nothing and no one could save Jonah from his wrong thinking. By the end of chapter one, a stark contrast starts to emerge between the us and the them. You've got heathen sailors crying out to God, showing deep concern for everybody on their boat, even the one who blatantly disregarded their lives. In chapter 1, verse 16, we're told that they, the them, they feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Who they are, the them, is contrasted with the us, who Jonah is. He's an accomplished prophet, the ideal Israelite, but he cries out to no one and the whole time is adamantly set against God's will. The entire time. Well, we'll see if three knots in the belly of the whale won't change his tune. Actually, it won't. <laughs> uh, in chapter 2, Jonah offers his thanks to God. It's Most of chapter 2 is his prayer because God just saved him from the whale. But it's important to know that he had yet to have any real heart change. He says in chapter 2, verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Chapter 2, verse 3, listen to this little snippet of his prayer. He says, for you cast me into the deep. Is that what happened? A little blame shifting, it feels like to me. Jonah had taken step after step out of God's will. God's will was this way, Jonah went this way, and at the end of all that, God failed him. Pick up in verse 4. Jonah says, Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. And he's not saying, Man, when I get out of here, first thing I'm going to do is go to church. No, he's saying that even though you let me down, God, into the deep, I will again orient myself toward your temple toward God's presence. In his mind, it's, it's him turning from the way he had been going against God's will toward God's, uh, towards God, toward God's temple, toward his presence. It's really a, a very typical, predictable Hebrew response. Thing is, is God isn't asking Jonah to orient himself toward the temple. 
God is using every force of nature to orient Jonah toward the them, the Ninevites. Yet another surprising kind of, whoa, that's crazy element in the book is while God's people are locked into Jerusalem and their identity, kind of a privileged identity as Israelites, his eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth and his gaze becomes fixed on who? The Ninevites. The Ninevites? I mean, they're totally in the wrong. They're not us. So why is he all about them? Jonah says in verse 8, remember he's still praying. He's still so thankful that he got saved. He said, I won't be like those who pay regard to vain idols. He's probably thinking of the sailors or the Ninevites. Those who forsake their hope of steadfast love. But God's steadfast love is immediately extended to them, to both of those groups, when they repent. Jonah's us versus them mentality doesn't fit with the fact that God seems to love the them just as much as he loves us. When he says in chapter 2 verse 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. Well, he's really happy because again, he just got saved. But what about them? Because for God, it's not, it's not us and them. It's all of us and Him. This story makes it loud and clear that both the us and the them are in the wrong. Being God's chosen people doesn't mean you can despise others. In fact, it means you're to be oriented toward others that are different from you in love. Jonah has to change. Being Ninevites doesn't mean, hey, because they don't know anything about God, they can do whatever they want. No way. Listen to what God says to Jonah. Nineveh's got to change. Chapter 3, verse 2. God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. That message is opposed to Nineveh's sin and Jonah's sin. Chapter 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose. He goes to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. That's what our Bible says. God tends to do things in really important places. Egypt, Babylon, Nineveh. You can think of Nineveh or the plagues on Egypt as kind of global teaching moments. He shows up, does big time stuff there, and he's doing it big time stuff on a big time stage basically because he wants everybody to hear and see and know who he is and how he deals with people like Nineveh and people like Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, as a former missionary myself, it's kind of something I'm recovering from, actually, uh, as a recovering missionary myself, uh, who regularly wrote letters back to my supporters. I'll say the only thing um, that's a little more lacking or worse than Jonah's four-chapter mission report here is his sermon, his preaching. This is a not-so-compelling, not very well uh, laid out eight-word sermon. And Nineveh repents? Again, this is another thing we're supposed to go, what? Are you serious? But if you look at the historical context, it's actually not that surprising. You can believe it. Under the current king of Israel, Israel's borders had been expanded all the way up to right next door to Assyria. Assyria owned Nineveh, I guess you could say it that way. Israel could expand like this because in the 8th century, Assyria's side of the Fertile Crescent was undergoing a famine. Not only that, but Assyria was fighting a war at that time on two different fronts. And in several places inside Assyria, a lot of not so loyal Assyrians were staging revolts against their local and regional governors, one of whom was the king of Nineveh. He wasn't the king of Assyria. He was just the governor of Nineveh. And we're about to meet him here in chapter 3. So this means that Assyria was weakened and distracted. They're not as awesome as they used to be. And the governor of Nineveh knows this. He's, 
He's looking to keep the people of Nineveh happy, but you know what? He's also kind of concerned because in sometime between 771 and 754 BC, a solar eclipse occurred. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody bought those like 3D disposable glasses and they had eclipse parties and watched it uh, and they barbecued. What it means was is that everyone was anticipating some sort of pending doom. Enter the eight word sermon from a really grumpy, really unloving guy whose most high God, just like the sailors, the Ninevites knew and remembered. He had done some crazy stuff back in Egypt. That happens and you better believe everyone's ready to believe. So while their repentance, I guess, when you put it in context, isn't that jarring. It's not actually that, oh my goodness, Nineveh repented. What is surprising is the contrast between the king of Nineveh and Jonah. The king of Nineveh seems to understand God on a level that Jonah doesn't. Listen to the king of Nineveh's response. This is chapter 3, verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Verse 7. And he issued a proclamation, published throughout Nineveh. He said, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. Verse 9, who knows? Who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we might not perish. Unlike Jonah, the king of Nineveh, he makes no claims to know exactly what God should do. He says, who knows? He says, he, he doesn't presume, he doesn't pretend, he doesn't, he doesn't think if we do X, Y, and Z, then God will be on our side. And we deserve that for God to kind of do what we want. You remember Jonah said with his lips, salvation belongs to the Lord, but the king of Nineveh owns that phrase with his actions and cause he calls all of his people to do the same. God may turn from his anger. He may not. God's sovereign. This is what Pastor West talked to you last week. This is on God. It's his doing. We can't control him. My job, the king of Nineveh says, is basically to help any and all, anybody within earshot, to have an opportunity to repent and align themselves with him. He's doing Jonah's job, actually. Like the sailors who didn't want anyone to perish, the king of Nineveh was already aligned with words that wouldn't be written for several more centuries. 2 Peter 3.9 says that our Lord does not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's always crossing this major divide between us and Him. While we insist on accentuating and focusing on the differences between us and them. Which, like Jonah in the story, is a laughable way to live. In chapter 2, when he got saved, uh, man, saved from the well, he's... He's making vows, sacrifices. He's praying with the best of them, pointing himself to the temple. But in chapter 4, when Nineveh gets saved, Jonah's tune changes for the worse. Listen to it. Chapter 4, verse 1. This displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? Can you hear the us versus them language? It's my country. It belongs to me. But wait, I, I kind of thought it was God's country. And I kind of thought all countries belong to God. It seems like Jonah might be finding a fair piece of his identity in being us and not in them instead of finding his identity in a God who's always intent 
on going after the them, which is actually us. Wait a minute, that's confusing. What am I talking about? It doesn't matter. I wouldn't worry about it because this little short-term mission trip to Nineveh is almost over. Jonah can go home. He can take a shower, wash it off, and count his blessings. But he's not one of them. One last thing before that shower, though. Jonah is going to stick it to God. He's going to let God have it. And he says in chapter 4, verse 2, That's why I made haste to flee for Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I knew you would relent from disaster. So awesome. People are always like, God's so mean. He's so intolerant. He's, he's so not loving. Yet Jonah saw his inner workings firsthand, up close and personal. And the problem wasn't that God was so wrathful and angry. The problem was that Jonah was wrathful and angry. God's actually so merciful and slow to anger if people repent. Jonah had made a very firm, clearly demarcated line of division between himself and those like him and the others. In his mind, there's a massive chasm of difference between the us and the them. That division actually brought him identity. Can you see it? Because a big part of who we are is not being them. It also brought him security because whatever happens to us, thankfully we're not them. Oh, there's belonging in that. There's identity and security in that. And here's what's even more significant is that once you make this big division between us, whoever us is, and whoever they are, it's just a minuscule little bitty step to naturally assume that God is on your side and not theirs. The shocking and surprising climax of Jonah, remember I told you, we're kind of supposed to be the whole time going, whoa, that's crazy, no way. You know what it's not? It's not the whale. It's not that an ancient metropolis steeped in sin from the lowest of men to the highest of kings would repent. That's actually not even that surprising. The shock and awe of Jonah is that there's no difference between us and them. Come to find out, we all just people. Don't you see how the world works? Don't you get it? Every polarized debate, every political issue is just a ploy to get you to firmly root yourself in the identity and security that one side provides over the other. Soon enough, we attach God to our cause and naturally he thinks about all this whatever this is the way we do wow that was, that was easier than i thought here's all these crazy complicated issues and differences and it turns out i'm right we're right and god's on our side this is this is kind of nice not only that but we have this group of others that we can blame and discriminate against and demean and dismiss. And that works great until you bump into God. Remember what happened just, just one paragraph, like two seconds before God brought down the walls of Jericho. You know, if you, if you, if you look in Joshua, the book of Joshua, about Two seconds before the walls of Jericho come down, Joshua 5, 13 says Joshua is sitting by Jericho. He lifted up his eyes and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in hand. And Joshua said to him, hey, are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you one of my soldiers or are you one of theirs? Verse 14, the answer comes back and it's no. No, it doesn't work that way. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I, God, have come. I've crossed the divide between you guys and me. I have come and Joshua fell on his face. For a brief split second, Joshua had made an us and them world. Which side do you fit on, God? 
and he doesn't fit on either side. He's totally different than all of us. All of us, any of us, who hear the good news and repent, he brings into his love. He saves. doesn't matter who you are. You're Joshua, you're Caleb, you're Jonah, you're Rahab the prostitute. You're the king of Nineveh. He will bring you into his side on his terms. He'll bring you into his identity and his security. But if you live a thoroughly us versus them divided kind of life like Jonah did, then you're going to have some big problems with who he is and how he does things. Jonah's disturbing us versus them thinking is the same disconcerting dynamic of our day. We got a lot of Christians running around whose identity, security, and conception of God is all tied up in being us and not in being them. Somebody should say, oh, Daniel, I thought we were supposed to be holy. I thought we were supposed to be set apart and different from the world. Yeah, you nailed it for sure. I mean, we're supposed to be. We should be different, but the primary thing that makes us set apart is what he's done, not what we've done. We've got the same sin in us that they do. So even though we're just as bad as everybody else, he crossed the line between us and him. He crossed that great divide. He saved us. That's the fantastic news. Certainly, as we follow after Christ, as we grow in sanctification, as we mature in our faith, um, we become different. We, we, we become changed. But deep down, we can't forget this, we're just like everybody else. And we know that he's the one who set us apart. That kind of person, that kind of Christian, understands that it's, what's God, it's what God has done that makes all the difference. That kind of man or woman walks around with a humble and wonderfully attractive posture. And as a result, the them in us versus them, the them wants to know more about him. If you're a Christian this morning, your God desires that none should perish. And right behind what Christ did on the cross, right behind the daily and active work of the Holy Spirit, His primary mechanism of accomplishing His grand plan of redemption, I hope you're ready for this, it's you. It's you. His love in you, in fleshed and lived out, you are supposed to be his hands and feet. Here's the deal. If you've got a list of folks you'd like knocked off like some kind of hitman, if you've got uh, groups of people you'd happily see wiped off the map, then you're a far cry from your father's children. And you're doing things with your hands and your feet and in your heart that he never intended to happen. Well, Daniel, I don't want them dead. I just don't want them and what they're all about anywhere near me. That kind of thinking got Jonah swallowed whole because it's in direct contradiction to who God is and what he desires. He's all about, he's all about letting every single person, no matter who the other is, no matter what race they are, what sexual orientation they are, what economic class they are, what nationality, letting them know. And he doesn't just let them know via a Facebook status or an email, no way. He lets them know through a lived out relationship over time with the real life Christian, that they most certainly, just like you did as a Christian, they most certainly have the opportunity to repent and enter into his favor. It's exactly what Pastor West was saying last week out of Jeremiah. If my people who are called by my name repent and turn from their evil way. And the thing is, is God's got people all over that we don't know about. He's got sheep that we don't even know about. And if they repent, no matter who the other is, if they turn from their wicked ways, they can enter into his love. You know, I can respect Jonah 
because he's the only one among us honest enough to admit just how difficult God's orientation toward the other can be. It was tough for him. He had a really firm and secure identity as, a, as, as God's people. And they were just so different, disgusting, off-putting, offensive, for you know, whatever reason, in so many ways. And God's orientation to him, to them, offended him. And he was honest about that. Verse 3 in chapter 4, he says, Therefore now, Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Verse 4, the Lord says, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Like, like is this a right response, Jonah? Of course, there's no answer to that. Verse 5, Jonah goes out of the city. He sets to the east of the city and makes himself a booth there. I guess it's like a man cave or something. And he's sitting there and he's hoping as he's looking at the city that enough of those Ninevites were fakers. So God will figure it out that Jonah was right and he was wrong and he'll have to bring down judgment on those guys. But apparently his man cave, booth thingy, didn't provide very much shade. So God causes a plant to grow up and give him some shelter. And for the first time in the whole book, we read in verse 6 of chapter 4, that Jonah was exceedingly grateful and glad because of the plant. And then God kills it. <laughs> and Jonah's really mad and wants to die again. And God says in verse 9, Do you do well to be angry about the plant, Jonah? Like, is this a right response, Jonah? Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Verse 10, and the Lord said, You pity the plant. Verse 11, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city over there, which there are 120,000 folks, people who don't know their right hand from their left, and also a lot of cattle? You're so worried about this plant, maybe you'll care about the cattle, but I care about the people. I care about them. What's wrong here, Jonah? And the book ends right there. <laughs> There's no like... Let's turn it around, let's write it up, let's make it look a little prettier. It's a total mess, and it ends right there. It's fantastic. Jonah's name means dove, which in Hebrew culture uh, is very frequently a symbol uh, for silly or senseless. Hosea 7, 11 is an example of this, and that's exactly what Jonah is. He's utterly senseless. His la he's laughable. His behavior throughout this whole mission to Nineveh has really been ludicrous. The good news is, though, he came to his senses. The whole reason why we have this book is because he came back to Israel and told this story. True to his call as a prophet, just as sure as he walked up and down the streets of Nineveh, he came back to Israel and walked up and down her streets and told this story, except this time he told it with a radically different heart, a radically different conception of God and himself and the other. He retold it time and time again, and he did so with no regard for himself. A lot of my missionary letters, you know, back to our supporters, I have to admit, you know, I kind of wanted to make myself look good. Jonah doesn't do that at all. He's totally honest with Israel about what he observed inside of himself because he sees the same thing in himself he saw in her. And if she was going to belong to God, then that inner wrong, that temptation to divide us versus them had to change. And so he told the story, not out of some false humility, but in deep truth. Yes, Israel was God's chosen people, but no, there could be no us versus them thinking. God's people are intended to be a royal priesthood, remember? That's what we learned in Romans. And who do priests serve? Themselves? No, no way. Others. Priests are to serve the them. So priests, I give you the nations. They're all around you, the races, the peoples, uh, groups of folks who are held in high esteem and derided by all. 
Behold, the fields are ripe for the harvest. But who will go? Who will not have an us versus them mindset? And who instead will look at things the way God does and sees it as us and Him? He's so different. He's so holy. He's so set apart. And that wrong in our heart that makes us want to look down on others instead of serving them and loving them. He says, Jonah, Daniel, Heritage, do you do well to be angry about those things? Is that a right response? Let me pray for you. God, thank you for uh, thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you, God, for uh, technology and the ability to to meet and be together, even uh, even uh, online. I pray, Lord, uh, that you would bless us, God. Bless us to be a blessing, overcoming us wrong thinking that keeps us from being your hands and feet. Um, overcome wrong thinking in us that causes us to want to use our hands and feet to kick and hit others and not serve uh, and love and lay down our lives so that they might know, so that they might too have an opportunity to repent, believe, and be saved into your love. Pray it in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, the word We'll bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why should?
Heritage Church, I bless you. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to go, uh, to, to leave behind wrong thinking about us and them and to go to them and in so doing encounter God and who He is and be changed. Just like Jonah was a totally different man. The man who wrote that book was a very different man from the one who lived the story inside of it. God changed him, which means God can change us. God saved Nineveh, which means He can save people from every tribe, tongue, and nation for Himself. I bless you to go, not to leave the church, but to go forth and be the church. Amen. <music>